Yeah, thanks for uh, doing this today, man. I appreciate you coming on. I've watched a few of your videos and checked out some of the things on your website. And uh, I'm actually really impressed with your knowledge base, it seems, of um, entheogenic history. And I'm also very impressed that you taught yourself Latin. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, a workable form of it. I'm, I'm like, I'm far from a Latin scholar, but I can, you know, I can translate a sentence is what I mean. What did you do that for exactly? Like, was it, was it certain texts that you wanted to read or books? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, to write my first book, The, the Witch's Ointment. Um, pretty much all of the texts and evidence that, you know, uh, one would need to be able to, you know, look at <laughs> that pertain to the subject. It was all in Latin. So it was either, well, I either have to learn Latin or I have to not write this book anymore. <laughs> and knock my phone over. <laughs> <laughs> so what was um, The Witch's Ointment about? I actually haven't read anything about your books. So what did you write about in that book? So The Witch's Ointment was my um, study of how medieval wise women were unfairly condemned as witches and part of what they were doing, some of them, not all of them, but a very few actually, uh, seem to have been using psychoactive, or we would say entheogenic, or I might say somnotheogenic ointments to fall into a very deep and lucid dream state where they would meet up with uh, different goddesses, um, pretty much the same goddess, but she went by different names depending on where you were in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so in Germany, she was called Holda in Italy, you know, certain parts of Germany, I should say. In Italy, she's called Madame Oriente in Milano, uh, she's called Benasosia down in southern Italy and uh, Epiphania, I think, uh, in the Wasser Valley. Uh, anyway, Wasser, no, not Wasser Valley. Anyway, the point is, sorry, she goes by different names. And um, Do you think it's related uh, oh, to, like, the same energy form as, like, uh, Mother Ayahuasca? Like, that same feminine energy? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, certainly a similar feminine energy, absolutely. I think, yeah, there, that it's just humans talking about the same thing, but using different vocabulary to do so, certainly. Um, I believe that, so, too. I think, um, uh, sorry, you can go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. What, what were you about to say? I think that, you know, this, it, it really just comes down to energy and how we, or in these certain frequencies and vibrations that come in, and depending on the culture that you're in is how you interpret it and what kind of symbols that you're going to use to, um, to interpret it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool, man. It's pretty cool. But uh, so but, we're um, getting back to it. What? What? Uh, anyway, to to wrap it up, what I do is I show in the book how certain theologians took the their own demonological ideas and applied them to folk beliefs, and how in one instance they did this to what later became called the witches' oil which is this oh, wow. ointment that uh, women rubbed on their bodies to fly to the devil, to, you know, party with demons and feast on children's uh, flesh and drink their blood and all that kind of stuff. And um, so, uh, but yeah, I think that that actually was based off of an entheogenic experience that got demonized by religious authorities, some religious authorities, not all of them, but some of them. And that, to answer your question, is what the witch's ointment was about. Wow. What's the uh, actual concoction? What's that? What was the actual concoction in the ointment? Oh, all kinds of different things. Uh, nobody, you know, there, there isn't just one recipe. I mean, you had some standards like um, henbane and um, deadly nightshade be, uh, because they'll kind of knock you into that deep lucid dream state. So normally those two or one or both would be in there, but then also you get opium, you get mandrake, um, mm -hmm. and other just symbolic ingredients like, you know, semen or menstrual blood or, you know, that kind of stuff. Wow. Goat milk. Hey, wow. That's not semen and menstrual blood. That's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's how people that took a recreational, uh, you know, substances in some cases in those days. Uh, they were called, on the Latin, poclamatoria, which means we would say a, a love filter or a love cup, or more closely, we would just call it like a recreational intoxicant. 
Um, mm. And these were just potions with these different psychoactives in them, but yeah, also with like menstrual blood. So if you were a woman who was trying to gain the, uh, the affection of somebody, you would mix this, you know, some kind of substance, whether it be henbane or mandrake or maybe a mushroom or who knows what, uh, in this potion, and you put some of your menstrual blood in there symbolically so that, you know, the, this person who you gave the string to would fall in love with you. Mm. I mean, you Have know, you ever seen the movie book, Midsommar? Right? What's that? Have you ever seen the movie Midsommar? No. Midsommar, the movie. Well, in, in that, they, um, I think you would actually like that. Midsommar, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's like a horror movie, but it's very beautifully filmed. And the way they depict uh, magic mus- mushroom us- usage is like in a, in a way that I've never seen in a cinematic form. And it has to do, have you ever heard of it at all? No. And just to, to is that M-I-D-S-O-M-A-R, Midsommar? Is that how you um, spell it? Yeah. It might be two M's, but yeah, it's mid. It's like midsummer, but midsummer in like uh, it's either like Swedish or Norwegian or something like that. Yeah, that's what I feel. And okay, it's, I'm, I'm it sure depicts. To yeah, I honestly think it's in your vein of of liking it. I mean, it's a little. It's like it's really brutal. Like it's extremely beautifully well filmed, but it's an extremely brutal film because it has to do with um, uh, you know, old pagan uh, midsummer festivals and sacrifices and uh, magic mu- mushroom usage and the way to depict it is just uh it's beautifully intense like i can't even explain it to you man you just have to check it out i think you would like it but i'm, I'm bringing that up because there's a there's a scene in the movie where i don't want to give away too much but there's a scene in the movie where one of the characters creates a potion out of her um menstrual blood and she puts her pubic hair in it and then for somebody else to drink it so that yeah, scene automatically yeah. came into my head yeah, and absolutely. they said most of those things in, in that movie are based on real rituals of like these uh, like Norse mytho- mythological rituals. It's insane. Sure. Highly recommend. Yeah, cool. I mean, I'm, gonna be, like, I'm not much of a horror movie person at all. <laughs> but, Me either. Um, Me yeah, either at all. Yeah. Is it like re... Okay. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I'll... I'll give it a shot, but if it gets to that point where it's like, I can't, <laughs> I, just, I, I am, yeah. I, I just, I'm not into horror movies. I feel you, man. I feel you. It's not for the faint of heart, but if you're into like the whole, like it, the history of, you know, entheogenic use. So what was the other word you used? Somogenic? Oh, somnotheogenic. Uh, it just means to generate divinity. Somnotheogenic? Somnotheogenic, yeah. Oh. Does that have to do with soma? No, it has to do with uh, the Latin word somni, which is oh. just dream. Oh, wow. Or it says Latin. Cool. Do you make that up? The, the word, yes, yeah, somnitheogen, I, I came up with that. That's cool. That's cool. I think yeah, I have a um, few of those. Well, what's the other words that you have? Uh, so I also have a uh, pythogen, which is using uh, psychedelics and magic. And um, another one, um, which is, okay, so this is, this is weird. That's not really that weird, but <laughs> it's okay. Most people would agree that psychedelics, um, you know, inspire artistic creativity. Some, you know, most people would, would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting is we don't actually have a word for that. Even though we, we somewhat take that for granted, we don't have a word for it. So I came up with poetogen, which is to use psychedelics in, you know, a creative way or, you know, for artistic purposes. Uh, there's also, so entheogen, which means generating divinity from within. I also, I came up with extheogen, which is generating divinities from without. Because when you look at some of these, like, magical books especially from the renaissance era these magicians that were inhaling these different substances like henbane opium cannabis a lot of the time um they didn't feel like they were always generating divinities inside themselves sometimes they were trying to like invoke demons or angels or other you know just entities Mm -hmm. that stood perfectly outside of themselves you know what i mean so that's not technically an entheogenic experience it's an extheogenic experience Mm. this is just me having fun with words that's all <laughs> yeah I mean, that is important though because we have to restructure what these 
uh, these, you know, magnificent substances are used for. And Terrence McKenna even said that, like, we have to rework our language in a way to essentially come to a new state of consciousness. Like, we have to, they're not just all drugs, that we all, everybody uses them for different reasons. And I like that you put these, um, I already forgot what those words are, to be honest. <laughs> like, I like how you are, you put those terms on them because it's, it's important for, you know, for, us living through the psychedelic renaissance, it's important for us to um, approach these substances and label them in a new way for the future to use them in a different way, rather than just saying, getting high, man, or, you know, these are drugs. Like, I think that's important, man. I think um, that's something that could catch on if you just keep using it, you know? And um, sure. somni ethnogenic, is that it? Somnotheogen. Somnotheogen, okay. <laughs> yeah, somnotheogen. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's in the vein of like, because I agree with you, like, that's what th this whole idea that we have to, um, you know, create these kind of models for future generations. That's what Humphrey Osman was doing when he coined the word psychedelic. That's what Carl Ruck was doing when he coined the word mm -hmm. entheogen, you know, they were they were yeah. handing us down these models to understand these medicines in a different way than it's just, you know, things that make you go crazy, which is what they were called, you know, in the 1950s, there were uh, LSD was referred to as a psychotomimetic, meaning a mimicker of madness. So that's why Humphrey Osmond coined the word psychedelic, because he's like, we got to get away from that. There's, there's so much more going on with this, you know, with these experiences. Yeah, I've been finding myself uh, refer to them even less and less so as psychedelics, to be honest, because that even seems to have a negative connotation. On it. I either say like um, entheogen or plant medicine or something along those lines, because the, the, even though psychedelic means well, it means like mind expansion, right? Or something like that. Mind manifesting. Mind manifesting. Like, even though that means well, it's still, we just come from a society where that just, just the word psychedelic has just, I mean, to me, it doesn't have a negative connotation, but like to the, the popular majority, like, you know, it's, it has this like weird like oh drug tripping bro you're getting high or something like that so yeah, yeah. it comes with baggage that's very important yeah it comes with yeah, cultural exactly. baggage i agree with you um which is it's a shame because psychedelic is actually my favorite term for that class of substances like i love the word psychedelic but i agree with you like it has this baggage to it um and people do really yeah. you know they think about it in terms that most people working with psychedelics don't think of them as you know what i mean like they, people think of psychedelics yeah. as like tie-dye t-shirts the beatles all that like people today that are discussing psychedelics are discussing like medicine and chemistry mm -hmm. and neuroscience and history and anthropology you know yeah. that's more of what we yeah. you know we, we mean so but uh you're right ultimately it does have that baggage to it yeah i mean um and it's it's coming out slowly and slowly how important these substances are to our history man uh and i so i've had so many questions that i want to ask you for, for first is uh cannabis is in the bible right cannabism yeah i believe so yes okay in yeah, because i've read songs. accounts go ahead go ahead sorry okay so, uh, yeah, I think in the Song of Songs and in um, uh, the, the story in Genesis uh, with uh, Rachel and Leah and the Mandrake, um, I think that they, oh, she, um, I'm, oh my goodness, I'm in the wrong, uh, I'm in the wrong psychoactive right here, not Mandrake, cannabis, cannabism. Yes, the reason I think, oh, that's in the Song of Songs as well. Uh, so in the Song of Songs, when cannabism is mentioned, it's mentioned alongside all these other exotic herbs. Now, Calamus, which is what cannabism has, in my opinion, been ero erroneously translated in, is not an exotic plant. It's just this marshy, reed-like plant. That's it. It mm -hmm. doesn't, there's nothing truly spectacular about it. Whereas if you're mentioning all these other fragrant canes, which is what cannabis also is, and you put cannabism, I mean, what else could it possibly be? On top of which, in every, almost every language, um, like that surrounded the ancient Hebraic la language used canna something as their word for cannabis. And it's oh, just, okay, so. yeah, there's yeah. actually, where is it? I had it somewhere. Oh, 
I used to have a list somewhere. Where'd it go? Of all the different. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so just real quick. Okay. Cannabis in Sanskrit is called canna. Cannabis in Assyrian is called kanabu. Cannabis in Persian is called kanab. Cannabis in Arabic is called kanab. Cannabis in Chaldean is called kanbun. And we're supposed to believe that kanabasm doesn't mean cannabis in ancient Hebraic. That is, that is, that does not make any etym etymological or linguistic sense at all. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. Yeah, right. All the areas surrounding it, but that that area right there, no, that that's not cannabis. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny, man. I never knew that. Yeah, it it doesn't doesn't make sense. So uh, also there was that recent discovery, um, last March or so, where um, they actually found this um, ancient Jewish temple, and um, on the on top of the incense burners, they had um, they found residue of cannabis. Like so, we know now mm -hmm. for certain. We have archaeological evidence that they were burning cannabis in this Hebraic temple. So, mm. cannabism is probably cannabis. Most likely, it is cannabis. Wow, that is that is insane if you think about it. Because think of the people that are most against cannabis in the United States or in the world. It's like the Bible Belt. When they have no clue, the, the irony of it is their whole the belief system, you know, had this built into it from the start. It's crazy. Well, uh, yeah, Judaism does. Uh, Christianity, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't make the same case for cannabis as built into Christianity as I would for built into Judaism. I mean, the holy anointing oil of the high priest and the, is, has cannabism in it. So, sorry. Yeah. So there, absolutely, we're talking about uh, cannabis built into the religious sensibilities. With Christianity, while if, let's say, for argument's sake, there was a historical Jesus, and there's no reason to not believe that there wasn't some guy there that later people put miracles, you know, and made up stories about, but um, in the Bible, Jesus is referred to, in the New Testament, I should say, he's referred to as a rabbi something like 41 or 42 times, but it's like just over 40 times. So mm -hmm. if to be called a rabbi would mean that he would be familiar with the Old Testament and the holy anointing oil and all that stuff. Um, so I'm not saying he wasn't familiar with it if he did exist. And I'm not saying that early Christians didn't use cannabis. I think they did because they were all Jewish. That's how they started off, right? The first Christians were Jews. So, um, you know, I, I think cannabis was definitely present. And uh, my colleague and uh, good friend, Chris Bennett, has shown really good evidence for why that's probably the case. Um, I still don't think it was built into Christianity. Yeah, it was just it was there, there, but it wasn't what it surrounded, yeah. right? I see. I mean, it definitely helped. It probably helped them <laughs> reach certain states of divinity in, in some way. Sure. And I mean, I think that they, if anything, they were using it for its medicinal purposes. Now, the thing is, when we think of medicine today, we draw a sharp line between medicine and let's say, magic and spirituality. In the ancient world, medicine, magic, and spirituality were all pretty wrapped up in each other. So yeah. when, if somebody says, oh, well, they were using it for medicinal purposes, yeah, but that means spiritual in some contexts, you know? Mm. Uh, especially when it comes to um, uh, um, extracting demons from the possessed. So that was one of Jesus' specialties, right? Apparently that was one of his, you know, his, uh, his, uh, yeah, specialties. Well, in, um, in the ancient world, one of the most popular ways of, you know, extracting demons from the possessed was by giving them mandrake, enough mandrake that kind of mellowed them out. Because in higher doses, mandrake will really kind of, I mean, you'll see some things and it'll really, you know, it, it mellows you out. <laughs> it mellows you out. And so these people that they believed were possessed by demons, they were probably you know, more likely schizophrenic or had some other kind of mental, you know, situation they were dealing with. Um, but mm -hmm. Mandrake was one of the most popular ways of doing that. So, you know, if Jesus was living in those days and he was a rabbi uh, and he did expel demons from people, then he most likely was using Mandrake to do it. 
Mm. Now, whether the gospel authors decided not to record that because of its implications in magic is, you know, it's possible, but ultimately we don't know. Mm. It seems like uh, he was some just a popular medicine man slash you know shaman. Yeah. In, in the um, I don't. I wouldn't necessarily consider him a shaman, only because the central like feature of shamanism is going in and out of the spirit world. You know what I mean? And bringing information from that spirit world back to this world. And there's no, yeah. like, I mean, uh, you could argue that, yeah, Jesus died and entered the spirit world when he was crucified, but it wasn't, I, I, I don't, he didn't, like, the central feature of shamanism is missing from pretty much every account of Jesus' life, so. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know but what you mean. Medicine man, he wasn't like a shaman. Medicine man, absolutely, that he was. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess I put it like this. Either Jesus... Either Jesus was channeling God and was healing people, or he was using the same pharmaca that everybody else was using in those days, which would be mandrake, yeah. opium, cannabis, things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, on the same note of Christianity, uh, I know your theory with the holy mushroom, you, you don't believe that mushrooms are present at all in Christianity, or at least in their art? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you made that distinction. Uh, because I I don't I don't believe they were se Christians were secretly painting mushrooms in their art, but there's no reason to believe that they weren't eating mushrooms. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and there's yeah. one text in particular. You know what? Okay, let me just I'll try to hold it up for you. So this is something that I discovered uh, and I put in my book actually psychedelic mystery traditions. And when we talk about mushrooms in Christian art, um, I found something. It's not Christian art. It's a medical text. But I believe that this person was, had actually used mushrooms. And this is here. Let me show you. So okay. take something like the entry for, can you see that opium? Can you see? Yeah, with the big O. Yeah, you see that with the big O like that? There's yep. a little embellishment. Most of the uh, different plants and uh, actually amphibian uh, medicines found in this particular uh, treatise are not even that decorative, right? That, that, that big O, they're, they're, they don't even look like that. They're, they're very basic, right? Yep. Here's the one for mushrooms. Um, can you see that? Wow. Yeah. It's a little difficult, I guess. You know, maybe if I bring it. What is that design? That's so that it says fungos, and that is oh. just see that how much how decorative it is? Yeah. I think whoever copy whatever uh, uh, scribe just so happened to copy out that particular version of Santa Sardini's Liber de Venenus, which means the book of poisons, I think that person whoever she was, had eaten mushrooms and chose to somehow, I don't know, tell us with that? I don't know. But uh, I, I, it's not conclusive. It's totally inconclusive. And I'll, I, I fully accept that. But my point is that if somebody were to express their mushroom use in art, I think it's going to look something more like that. It's not going to be the secretive thing for 2,000 years. Conspiracies don't last that long. They just don't. You know, it's really, really <laughs> difficult. And on top of which, like, we have good evidence for medieval Christians using substances. Like, I have, or in that book I just showed you, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions, I have three different chapters on how Christians used entheogens in the ancient and medieval world. And mm -hmm. I use all primary source material, and nobody talks about painting mushrooms in Christian art. They talk mm -hmm. about using mandrake to enter the Godhead. Uh, they talk about using cannabis for similar reasons. Um, there was one Syrian bishop named Theodoret who wrote that he enjoyed um, taking an opium. I don't know how. Either he drank it, most likely, or he smoked it, or I, I don't know how he took it, or he ate it. But he would take opium, and then he would read from the Gospels just because he enjoyed doing that just being high on opium and reading the gospels. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if somebody were going to talk about 
painting mushrooms secretly in Christian art, or maybe not so secret, I just think that guy would have, you know, noticed it maybe. I mean, there, I, I guess what, there's no reason for this to be a secret. Yeah. There's no reason. I know what you Christians mean. Christians wrote openly about their substance use. This was before Nancy Reagan. This was before the war on drugs. This is before reefer madness. They, they didn't have those paradigms back then. It wasn't, you know, evil to take something, you know, just mm -hmm. for the sake of taking something. Mm -hmm. You don't think the church would condemn people for using it? It did in some cases, but not, you know, like it was still widespread. I mean, the church complained about it but they couldn't do anything about it. I mean, do you know how many yeah. different councils they had to have to tell those monks to stop drinking, tell them to stop <laughs> gambling? It's like every few years they had to do, do this. Why? Well, because the monks were still fucking gambling and drinking and <laughs> going out to whorehouses and just living the life. You know, they didn't give a shit. Yeah. Because, dude, like, mm -hmm. how, do, how do you police that? The church could complain yeah. all it wanted about this stuff. People did it anyway. They didn't care. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, back in there was no internet in the medieval ages. Like there was no surveillance. Like there weren't yeah, even telephones. Or yeah, papers. Like, exactly. Yeah, there was nothing. It's true. It was a totally different world. Totally different yeah. world. What was the um? Uh, what what did the actual text say in your book about the fungus? What did the text say about? Oh, this about it's, just, the fungus. it's just about med medicinal stuff. It's just uh, you know how you could use mushrooms to like help. Uh, for humors like stuffing up the head. Um, oh. So this is, you have to understand a little bit of, of like medieval and early modern medicine. They believed in what were called the four humors, which were an imbalance of these humors. I believe it's a uh, yellow bile, black bile, blood, and saliva. Those are the four humors. And an imbalance mm. of those humors causes disease. So they just, wow. a lot of these recipes are all just talking about how to balance the four humors. Wow. That's interesting. I never heard that before. Yeah. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Um, they're medical books. And they're medical books like that scribes are just copying from earlier medical books. So, you know, they, they, don't, they don't veer from the path so much. Mostly because paper was so expensive, or papyrus really, was so expensive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You can't really... There's not really too much room for commentary. I mean, although sometimes, I mean, you do get comments, like in the margins, but. Mm. Well, now, what about the Amanita muscaria? Was, uh, I know one misconception that is widely held today is Santa Claus being the Amanita muscaria. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that even come from? Some, is it just some random guy on the internet decided to make that up? You know, that's a great question. I've been trying to find, I've been trying to pinpoint where it originates from. And there's definitely James Arthur's book, uh, Mushrooms and Mankind, I believe is the title. Yeah, Mushrooms and Mankind. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he's, as far as I know, the earliest author to talk about it. But I'm pretty sure that he was getting it from something earlier. Uh, I just don't know what that thing was. Yeah. Yeah, because that always, that, I, I fell for that one. And then I heard you say it wasn't true. Oh, I did too. And, I fell and I for like, it. Damn, they got me. The internet got me. <laughs> what other misconceptions are there out there that are like these popular, um, I guess you can say conspiracy theories about psychedelics? Well, some like, what are the biggest theories. Ones? Oh, sorry, what was it? What, what, like, what are the biggest ones that are out there? Okay, so some are conspiracy theories, like the holy mushroom, that's a conspiracy theory. But mm -hmm. other ones are just poor history, like the um, the witches masturbating with broomsticks thing. I don't know if you're familiar with that. that one. No. Okay, so that's one of the things I address in my book, The Witches Ointment. So if you were to uh, Google witches and flying ointments, and probably on Wikipedia would be my guess it would say this, um, it'll say that... Um, that the where we get the idea of riding on brooms like witches riding on brooms comes from when like the these witches these accused witches uh oiling up their brooms with these psychedelic and entheogenic ointments and masturbating with them and that's how they delivered you know the substances into their system now as oh, charming damn. as that is it's there's <laughs> that's there's no record of that anywhere that we actually know the origin that was made up in 1973 by a guy named Michael Harrison in a book called The Roots of Witchcraft. I don't mm -hmm. know 
why or how he came up with that, but he did. And then Michael Harner, another Michael H., uh, expanded upon that idea in his book, um, Hallucinogens and Shamanism, in the, uh, the chapter he did on you know, uh, witches' ointments and witches' uh, hexing herbs. And it's a great chapter. It's fantastic. Uh, but I think that he has that very wrong. Mm, I've never heard of that before, and that is very interesting. I guess Michael Harrison, is that his name, Michael Harrison? Yeah, the first guy is Michael Harrison. He just had a weird sense of humor, I guess, or something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, people, have, you know, they have odd ideas about things. So, I, don't know. I don't judge. Yeah, yeah, can't judge, I guess. But don't tell the wrong history. Like, don't put it as... Well, that, yeah, that that becomes, you know, it becomes a thing. And because for me, psychedelic history is sacred. I I tend to get, like, a stick up my ass about it. Uh, so it's kind of in the way, like, like think of, a, of somebody that's not a really excellent facilitator. It's just like, ah, what are you doing to this sacred you know, concept. I feel the same way about the history. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing to this sacred concept? Like, I think history by itself is pretty sacred and then throw psychedelic history onto that. I think that's really sacred. Mm. So, um, you know, and shouldn't we want to know if we're you know, like, if we're truly interested in what our ancestors were doing, then wouldn't we want to know what they were doing? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> How about, I heard this the other day. Um, the Eucharist being like uh, like LSD, like some kind of bread. Do you, do you believe in that? Is there any sources on that? So there's, there's some ancillary evidence for that. Um, yeah, in 1 Corinthians, uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the Christian community in Corinth, um, he mentions that some of the more wealthy Christians, when it's time to gather, you know, and have their, their sacred meal, they're getting together too early when the poor people, the poorer Christians, are still out laboring in the fields. And because the, the more wealthy Christians are enjoying the Eucharist without the others, they're taking too much of it, and it's causing them to become, and to quote Paul, weak, ill, or dying. So, well, what was in that bread and wine that would cause eating too much of it to have the result of you becoming you know, ill or even dying, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so there's pretty much that. And there's also just the idea that the idea, like, like these kinds of, you know, ceremonial Eucharists, so to speak, were used throughout the pagan world. And again, there was nothing from stopping you know, a converting pagan into Christianity from still saying, well, fuck it. I like putting opium in my beer and my wine. I'm mean, going to just keep doing that. You know, like there wasn't, there weren't all these, you know, laws and strictures yet. Like we're speaking on 2000 years of Christian law and Christian history. The people back then weren't. So they, they converted to Christianity and in many cases just carried on doing whatever they were doing. There were no drinking laws in early Christianity. In fact, in early text uh, called the Didache, which is around the turn of the first century of the Common Era, uh, it says that, yeah, it's good to use wine, but not to use it in excess, but by all means use wine. But again, mm -hmm. this totally leaves up to each person to decide, well, what's too much wine for me? You know, yeah. who's going to police this? Nobody. Yeah. And wine back then was way stronger than the bullshit we have today, <laughs> you know? Even yeah. wine that didn't have additives in it, like even wine that didn't have mandrake or cannabis or opium was still pretty strong in and of, of itself. That's why a lot of the ancient authors would write that it's like they would have to like water down their wine because it was just too strong. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Speaking okay. of which, is it cool to smoke a bowl on, on screen or not? hundred percent, man, of course. Okay, cool. <laughs> It's 100%. Um, it, I actually want you to smoke a bowl. <laughs> That's great. But yeah. Uh, yeah, cannabis is, uh, I guess the Rastas were right. <laughs> what is the, the history of Rastas? Like, why do they cherish uh, cannabis so much? I have no idea. I mean, because it's so awesome, I guess. I, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> I so. Like, yeah, for the same reason, I guess anybody would cherish it as like a soul medicine or, yeah. you know, 
I don't know. It, it's it's so worthy to be cherished. <laughs> like, yeah. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah. Same thing with mushrooms. It's like, why did you know the ancient Aztecs worship this mushroom? Because holy shit, have you ever eaten them? They're pretty <laughs> awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah. Any scrutiny to these substances come usually comes from people that haven't done it, or just heard yeah. negative things about it from other people that haven't done it. <laughs> yeah. Or have done it and just changed their mind about it, which happens too. But it's like, I agree with you though, that the majority of people or people that just haven't done it that are commenting on it. And it's like, you know, nobody just ever says like, Hey, you know what? You don't actually know what you're talking about. Yeah. So maybe stop talking because you don't know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent, man. Um, I had another question I wanted to ask you about. What was it? Awesome. While you think of that, I'm going to have this one again. Cool. It was something because I, I have a lot. Oh, okay. Stoned ape theory. Do you believe in Terrence McKenna's stoned ape theory? Um, <laughs> let's see. I believe in, so not as it stands. However, I think that if you were to take it out of the realm of biology and put it into art, and move it forward a few hundred thousand years up the evolutionary chain, then I think you can make a cultural argument for the stoned ape theory, not a biological one. I think there are far better explanations for evolution than eating mushrooms. Now, does that mean there's no merit to the stoned ape theory? Absolutely not. Like it's, how can I put it? it doesn't not make sense <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah. it does make sense um but I think where you can actually see it is updated and in art um in what do you mean by that post. what's that what do you mean by that can you expand so, on that yeah sure so like carvings here uh let me see I think somewhere in this I have the image of Persephone rising from the dead with the opium um oh okay well here's I mean there's the famous um to silly cave this isn't a very good image but you know the the famous it's called the bee shaman mm -hmm. the guy okay. holding mushrooms i mean we don't know if it was a bee or a shaman but you know the 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 idea of the mushrooms being there i think is pretty solid um but so we see it there we see it uh okay so here you have Persephone rising from the dead. She's holding snakes, grains yeah. of wheat, and opium poppy. Uh. Um, there's also a um, an ancient Minoan poppy goddess from ancient Crete that uh, Persephone's mother, at least in mythology, is probably based off of uh, uh, Demeter is her name in Greek. But um, So I think you see it there. Uh, you also see it in artwork over in Uruk, which is the... Uh, the people that predated Sumer. Um, so even before the Sumerian people, you, you have um, this association of opium and wheat, um, especially carved in, in vases or in stone in some instances. Uh, so that's where I think you see the fruits, let's say, of the cultural stone date theory. Mm, I see. Opium seems to be very uh, prevalent. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, nice. in the ancient world, it was one of the more famous uh, substances used. People loved opium. Opium and mandrake were the two biggies. What is mandrake? Is it a flower? Mandrake is a root. Um, oh. It's a solanaceous plant. Um, it's an herb. It um, has similar effects as belladonna and henbane, uh, also in the solanaceous family of plants. Um, it causes in small doses it'll cause kind of like a drunk like stupor you know you'll just kind of be very mellow and feeling good uh higher doses will get you really 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 mellowed out and you might start to see things um in even higher doses you're definitely going to be seeing things uh as just a prelude to a very long and deep and lucid dream state so like your dreams are going to be wild and you're going to be like like in it <laughs> you know you're gonna be in the dream and in even higher doses you're gonna kill yourself oh wow so it's poisonous yes you know, oh, highly shit. poisonous wow yeah i don't mess with those man i don't mess with poisonous stuff i mean i'm not if anybody wants to you know go ahead but be safe 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I do. But as I say to everybody, stick to the safe, illegal stuff like mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, mandrake is mushrooms. totally legal. Uh, henbane, totally legal. Belladonna, totally legal. Um, and they, they'll kill you. Mushrooms are not going to kill you. I mean, unless you do something dumb. But, you yeah. know, like the mushrooms themselves are not going to kill you unless you eat one, you know, a poisonous one, mm. uh, which you don't want to, you know, obviously do. So that is weird. Like, why are all of those things that you could, I could probably get on eBay or something uh, shipped right to my house that obviously caused me some kind of delirium or some kind of intoxication or, you know, have me talking to God, whatever it is. Why are those legal when I could die from them? But magic mushrooms and cannabis, don't touch that. Don't touch that, kids. I mean, same thing with alcohol. Yeah. I can buy, I can buy a lethal dose of that. I can kill myself with alcohol. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a rough going, but I can do it. Yeah. We live in a backward society, man. Like, it's just oh, you it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yes, I've noticed. I've definitely noticed. It's, it's craziness. It's, yeah. it's absolute it's, insanity. Yeah, it is. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, the fact that we still have people in prison... <laughs> Well, there's, I mean, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Like, there's a, there's a dispensary everywhere. Like, if I were to stand on my roof, I would see two dispensaries in <laughs> yeah. just my neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. In the same country, you have people serving very long prison sentences for, you know, having certain substances or manufacturing certain substances. It's, uh, it's craziness, man. I think the world is changing, but it's a slow process right now. It is a slow process, definitely. Uh, well, you're on the East Coast, right? Yeah, I'm like right outside of Boston. Oh, cool, yeah. I'm from New York originally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's cool, man. It's getting a little cold. I mean, weed is legal in Massachusetts now, so shout out Massachusetts. Nice. Go Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, go uh, Massachusetts. Is it legal for recreation as well or just medicinal? Uh, yeah, med uh, medical and recreation too. Nice. So you guys have dispensaries, like in Boston. Like, you, like, yep. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's cool, man. It's a lot of regulations in Massachusetts compared to Oregon and uh, in California, I can imagine. But it's still, you know, and the prices are extremely, extremely high compared to the rest of the country. But uh, yeah, we can get it legally and smoke it anywhere we want to, unless it's in some kind of uh, establishment or something. You are like a school zone or something. But... Yeah, don't smoke in the school zone. <laughs> I mean. Truth be told, though, like, I, I still get my cannabis from my farmer, like, because it's way yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah I good. don't go to dispensaries at all. Yeah, if you know a guy, you really don't need to, to be honest with you. Or if you know how to grow yourself, you really don't need to. Yeah, and the potions that I make, I mean, not to be a jerk, but they're better than what are in the dispensaries because I don't have government regulations. Like, so my, my potions, like, my, my weed stuff, like, confections and potions and shit, <laughs> what do you make i make two in particular i make a cannabis potion um which is just straight cannabis and i make a second potion which is a mixture of cannabis mandrake henbane and psilocybin wow that's intense Intestines. yeah <laughs> that you what, can't get in stores but uh, yeah wow I'm, what kind of visions or revelations do you come to on that concoction it's more the body high you get from it mm -hmm. it's like yeah it's the the way the psilocybin mixes with the mandrake it's really like uh, one person said that it was the closest thing to feeling like they were on mdma without being on mdma that they've ever experienced that's pretty intense man yeah wow. so yeah and it's because of the psilocybin and the mandrake the way they they interact with each other or at least that's that's my theory. <laughs> I don't really yeah. know, actually, but that's my guess, uh, just based on how, like, the feeling, because it has that mandrakey and mushroom-like elation to it. Mm. So, yeah. Mm, that's pretty cool. I mean, you just made your own brew, essentially. Like, that's your own, you know, that's your own, like, you got your cauldron, that's your own yeah. mixture. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's my own recipe. Wow. And I write about it in uh, my book, uh, Microdosing Magic, a psychedelic spell book. Mm -hmm. um, chapter, I mean, it has nothing to do with microdosing at all. I just, I wanted to write a chapter. So it's about just that potion. It's how to make it. And it's about the lore surrounding how to actually make it. Oh, so this is, that potion is from history? 
no, 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 no. It's just oh. my own lore about I, I, oh. you know, that I came up with my own I little see. occult story about the potion. <laughs> What's the occult story? Can you give a synopsis? Yeah, it's called the Cosmic Orgy in a Mason Jar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's all about um, getting um, Dionysus mm -hmm. <laughs> to um, party and fornicate with um, certain goddesses um, it's like Hikate uh, and Circe. And, oh, please send me my little kitty guy right here, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, how that process uh, creates the potion. Wow. That's oh, wait. So the process of you communicating with those beings is what creates the potion, you're saying? No, the process of making the potion. I and write about making the potion. Like, the, the steps in the recipe are written about in, like, occult language, like, in oh. veiled terms. But I let you know what everything means. Oh, but okay. then there's just the story of, you know, how Dionysus is, you know, and they have to enter, you know, into um, uh, the bed, the uh, just some area in the sun, Apollo's domain, which is the oven, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's all kinds of different, you know. That's I don't cool. want to give too much away. I feel you. It's almost like a code. It's like you use some kind of code to create the concoction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's pretty cool, man. I'd have to read your books. Yeah, they're they're fun. Uh, microdosing magic, anyway. Like if for that, it's it's in there, mm -hmm. and it's short. It's like a hundred pages. It's quick. So you are all you're into the occult and magic, right? Uh, mostly witchcraft, but yeah, occult witchcraft stuff. I don't really know too much about it. So, what do you do? Certain rituals that involve oh, yeah. these substances? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're you're listeners and viewers are interested if you go to youtube and type in psychedelic historian my page will come up um like i don't like i don't have a thousand subscribers yet so it won't you can't type in youtube.com slash psychedelic historian so i think mm -hmm. you need a thousand to be able to do that um so you would just have to go to youtube and type in the search engine psychedelic historian and anyway um my videos i have are called the medicine diaries and there i talk about my different rituals and what i do with mushrooms and things like that That's cool, man. see i'm not into i don't know anything about ritual uh anything really about rituals just i just know about mushrooms so what what do you get from incorporating the two in your life like is there is there an effect oh yeah I think so. Um, well, for me, you have to, hmm. So this is all going to sound crazy because um, I am not an atheist. Mm -hmm. And I know that most people are. And I know that most people that are atheists look down on people like me that are not and perfectly welcome to do so. I don't care. Uh, so a lot of what I do with these mushrooms, yeah, is trying to put myself in communication with you said earlier that everything goes back to energies. That is, I, I agree with you, but I also think that part of the human experience, just for fun because we can, is um, giving form to those energies and re representing them by something to make mm -hmm. them more accessible for use or for just you know, uh, for communication with, in a yep. sense, you know what I mean? Yep. So it, it's, I just wrap up those ideas of energy in, you know, language that appeals to me. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like whatever caused the entire universe to be here, I refer to as Gaia. I don't, I doubt that that thing, whatever it is, would call itself Gaia. I have no idea, <laughs> but that's what I call it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. It just, it helps it be more accessible. Please send me. What? <laughs> mm. All right. You want to be on camera? What's the cat's name? This is, what? This is Chrisemi the Lionheart. <laughs> Looks like a big cat. Uh, well, she is a warrior priestess, so. Oh. <laughs> but she's also very affectionate and loving. Yeah, she licks your face. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my sweet baby. Just give me a little bit more time, baby. She's probably hungry. But... <laughs> oh, but man, yeah. that's great. Give me just a little bit. Give me like 20 minutes, baby girl. Sorry. That's fine, man. That's fine. 
So what, um, getting on your belief system. So what is, what are your beliefs about, you know, what the hell is going on in this crazy ass universe, man? Do you believe in what is God? What is God to you? I still don't know. And that's one of the reasons that I eat mushrooms and drink ayahuasca and even uh, smoke cannabis and make it into potions is to try to find out and get closer to whatever that thing is. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, it's rough because on some days I, I'm like, maybe I'm not so convinced it's even there. It's just here and, you know, ha here and there that'll happen. But most days I think there's something there and I just, I don't actually know. <laughs> I, don't I don't think know. you can know. I don't think, yeah, I don't, I think it's, it's really just a matter of if you think there's something else going on behind the scenes or if you don't, but there's no words or symbols that can really be put on the truth. Well, I think that I, words, yes, but symbols, I think that that's exactly what symbols do. Symbols give us truths where words fail. Hmm. See, I see words as just another symbol. I think they can point you in the direction. So you said symbols, yes, like like images and stuff that you, you can get like a, something, you can get more out of images than you can words. Well, symbols, yeah, like something like a symbol, because a symbol is many, 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 many words delivered directly to you in one shot. I see, yeah, I know what you mean. Whereas like, words, you read them to get the idea of what's going on. Like what, what would take a chapter in words could be said with one symbol, mm, I, or, I know you know, you so to speak, you know, at least in my opinion, I think so. Mm. Uh, so, but yeah, sorry. No, yeah, that makes sense, man. I, I know what you mean. I just still don't, I don't know if there's any, like, yeah, you can have all of these symbols and they're all pointed, like, I guess you can look at like holy text as one big symbol and they all, or, you know, even like these psychedelic substances and they all point in that direction, but there's nothing that can really give you the truth. Like that, that truth. And we can't, and if, even if I knew the truth, even if I came to this, like this conclusion, like, I know the truth, like, you know, like you come to some psychedelic revelation, I can't tell you. There's really nothing. I can't paint you a picture. There's, there's, there's something sure. that you, it's like the felt experience. Yeah. You just have to feel it. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I think that there's one thing that I hope they do in the very least is just show that you, you shouldn't pretend to know more than you can know. Mm. Like the universe is far more interesting than your opinions of it mm -hmm. and i think that that's the greatest thing about psychedelics yeah is that it humbles you yeah um well hopefully i'm not for some people but you know <laughs> yeah i know it, what you mean it showed yeah it, it should humble you to show you the the, the great mystery that we live in like this in, enormity of it when some people like, yeah, I know what you mean. They kind of get this, like, they think they're, they're like the Messiah, like the weird Messiah complex from it. There's yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people, it's like they go, they do a ayahuasca retreat and then they determine based on that, that they're now life coaches. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and no disrespect is meant by that, but it's just like, you know, maybe look into it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah before you start telling other people how to operate their lives, mm. you know, it's, you know, the, the medicines can give you the insight, but you still have to do the work, mm. you know, and the magic can help keep you on track and focus with the work. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I use, you know, it for, but, um, you know, it's not, they're not magic bullets. And I see more and more in like, popular culture they're being um you know portrayed as magic bullets and they're not you know you have to do the work with them yeah what's they the work you saying what's that is the work like ritualistic stuff like you do well in my case it is but not in everyone's case i mean i think that using ritual and using magic and witchcraft makes doing the work easier because it defines it in at least in my opinion far more interesting ways and it's far more artsy and creative to think about things magically. Um, so I don't know. That's that's another reason why I use it. 
Yeah, I know what you mean. Everybody's work could be different. Like, I feel like my work, I'm a yoga teacher and I just, I love yoga and meditation and my work to reach certain deeper states is through my practice. Like, I, that is, that's like my whole being. Like, it's another just part of my day. It's just like almost like brushing my teeth and I have to incorporate yoga and, and yoga and meditation has allowed me to, to deepen those, um, those mindsets that I get to on those, you know, entheogenic substances and I honestly haven't done that. Like I haven't taken a high dose of anything in a long time, but, but I have, and I still, you know, once you go through the experience, you can't undo the experience. And it's allowed me like me taking care of myself in that way. And, you know, doing the yoga and whatever meditation I do has allowed me to, to look at those experiences in a different light and relate it to more of just a, I I guess a grounded experience of this reality that we live in. Do you know anything about, um, like I heard Amen. Alistair Crowley. <laughs> Thanks. Amen. I heard Alistair Crowley um used to do like yoga magic. And I don't know anything about that. Do you know anything about that? I don't know much about yoga at all, unfortunately. Um mm-hmm. I know a little bit about Crowley's work, or I guess Crowley, it depends on if you find him holy or foully. Um <laughs> uh but Crowley, um Yeah, he was into, at least as far as plant medicines, uh, he was into hashish, uh, mescaline, peyote, things like that. Um, Mm. And uh, I don't know too much about how he used it. Uh, uh, Not to bring up my buddy, well, actually not to bring up my buddy, uh, Chris Bennett again. He knows far more about that. In fact, he just had Crowley mess yesterday, uh, or Crowley mess, sorry, excuse me. Uh, yesterday, which was a small conference on Aleister Crowley and magic and, you know, entheogens and things like that. Mm. Yeah, I think he was an extremely interesting individual. And I remember I read one time about they used to do yoga at his sessions. And I'm like, where's that? Where's the parallel between, you know, the yoga that we see in in Hinduism and Aleister Crowley? I'm like, it has to have something to do like with the energies, getting back to the energies. It's just a manipulation of Sure. Uh, of, of the of the body or something uh, you should try it out sometime man i think you'd you'd like it well, it's it's a medicine it, in itself in an odd way i have because part of and a very small part of um the um the thelemic mass that gnostic uh churches like oto t- uh, temples still perform to this day uh part of it is there's kind of like a yoga pose when you're on your knees or something Mm-hmm. And um, I've done that pretty high. <laughs> I've done the whole. Ma- I've participated in the mass, um, not not uh, not high because I wouldn't do that. Like to you know, if I'm participating, but if I'm just an onlooker, you know, um, just going to the mass, then I've done it a few times where I've taken some of my potions. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, in a way, I've done Crowley magical yoga with a psychedelic (laughs) hey that's something yeah because um uh there's just i don't know there's something about yoga like there's uh like in holotropic breathing exercises you can get to some pretty uh i mean i'm not gonna say like it's like your potion but there's some pretty extreme extremely uh far out states that you can get your mind to even just in like a sober like no any kind of chemical uh you know, any kind of chemical messenger, like you just literally just by altering your breathing, you can get to some kind of psychedelic states. I have at least, and a lot of other really? people have too. Yeah. Oh, I would, you have to do that. I mean, I've heard about that. I know what holotropic breath work is, but I don't know, like I've never done it before. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. I mean, and even if you mix your breathing, like those breathing techniques with your potions or anything, you could probably get to a whole new level. That sounds like a great idea. You. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Wim Hof? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like stuff like that. Like Wim Hof is pretty much, he's like the, you know, he's like the one that's popularized the whole. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah, he's the guy. But there's other, there's many other techniques that involve like controlling your breath and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. It's uh, it's it's a whole other way of just going into the depths of your mind. It's, uh, it can be intense at times too. Like this, this like, I mean, people say, I don't know what the, the credibility of it is, but people say you can induce uh like endogenous dmt and doing those certain breathing exercises allows you to 
to do it like yourself. Uh, I don't know how credible that is, but there have been, I've never done DMT in my life, to be honest with you, but oh. there's, there's been times where well, I you've do done it. Aya, right? No, I've never done ayahuasca either. Oh, I thought you, okay. I thought you had, sorry. No, I'm not, I'm not a uh, dimethyltryptamine experience user. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, it's cool. The only like experience that I have with it is just like high doses of psilocybin and cannabis really, but, uh, and doing a lot of yoga and meditation. Cool. But yeah, there's been states where I'm just, I do like those breathing exercises by like Wim Hof or any, any other kind of breathing exercise. And I'm just like, this isn't, it feels like I'm under the influence of something. Like there's some other chemical, uh, there's just something happened in my brain. I don't know what it is that I, I don't feel sober. But the thing is like, you can easily just come back to sobriety if you want to call it sobriety, just by changing your breath. Like just by coming back to a regular pace. It's pretty cool, man. I, I would definitely encourage you to like uh, explore that if you're into like, you know, obviously you are into going to into the deep depths of our uh, of the human mind. I think that's a good addition for you. Yeah, I'd love to, especially the idea of mixing the potion with it. That sounds like a, I can't that sounds imagine. cool. I want to give that a shot. Yeah, I, I got to look at how to do this stuff. <laughs> As I hear about it. What's that? It's a whole new world when you get into like the, the aspects of that. Because, you know, yogis have been doing that for thousands of years just in the mm. himalayans and people figured this out thousands of years ago somehow altering your breath gets you to these crazy deep states yeah i mean could have even started like running from predators mm. you know and you're just out of breath and just you're i mean even just running i mean if you really push yourself you get that runner's high and if you were to just kind of follow that lead where it goes um you know at least that uh, you know uh, that that I'm, I'm, I'm hypothesizing as to how that started in the first place. You know, yeah, the yeah. idea of, you know, altering your breath to achieve these, uh, these different states of awareness. Yeah, that makes sense. They are either probably like going after like some kind of prey, like some hunting animals or something. And they needed the oxygen. So then they felt the physiological difference. And they were like, wait a second, let's do this. We're not hunting. <laughs> let's go back to camp and try this out and see how we feel. Sure. Yeah. That's interesting, man. Uh, yeah do you have any other like uh what, what any other crazy conspiracies that you'd like to speak about anything else that you want to get off your chest <laughs> uh let's see um like, no, some just, big ones. Uh, well i guess like we talked about the big ones we talked about the um the holy mushroom we didn't really get too deeply into uh the santa claus thing but we brought up and again that's not really a conspiracy i wouldn't consider that the only the only real sorry okay. just going nuts back there um the only real conspiracy theory in psychedelia is the holy mushroom so i mean yeah. we, we can elaborate on that if you'd like but um you know but that's the only one i really know about yeah well do you think all um we don't have to expand on that because you know people can look it up themselves if they wanted to sure but if do you think all of our belief systems are stemmed from these plant medicines or entheogenic or substances or practices? Do they all come from us just going out of the default mode network and just seeing life in a different light? Um, well, so I agree that it, it results from us falling out of our default mode network and seeing, you know, a new kind of world or place, but I don't think that it, uh, it started with, psychoactives i think uh and this is in the vein of the um edwardian anthropologist edward tyler um that people's first contact with another world was in dreams ah mm, that makes a lot of sense yeah that was i think that we were dreaming before we were taking you know psychoactive plant medicines mm. um so and i think that that you know predate psychedelia by who knows how long you know dreaming yeah. does yeah that makes a lot of sense because you know it's something that we do every single night and we go to these different worlds and nobody really knows why yeah and uh, yeah to this day we don't even know why and how would let's say how would you know we let's put ourselves back in the past like how would a proto-human interpret a dream where a deceased loved one visits them. Mm. 
You know what I mean? Like, what would they interpret that as? Like, would they see that as this voice, th this being coming from another realm and that that realm could be accessible through dreams? You know, who knows? And then at some point, you know, they ate mushrooms and discovered opium and cannabis and everything. And we're like, holy shit, <laughs> this puts you in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's, we still, like you said, we don't know what dreams are. There's still a mystery. It, it might be some kind of communication with an outside source. Like, who knows? Chris Sammy, baby girl. Can, can you hear her through? A... I can hear the cat, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> she's not she used to being ignored. I apologize. She gets a lot of love and attention. So it's fine. A, yeah, it's my first like... cat on the podcast. That's cool. Oh, nice. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that Chris Sammy. I Ooh. mean, what do you think dreams are, man? Like, what? They got to be something, right? Or do you, like, because there's some people that say they're just this, they're nothing. They're just our mind. Just experiencing the sleep state and it's just remnants of the day and then you can have other people saying like no you're tapping into like a whole different world and it's just I don't know how we interpret it hmm yeah i like that i have no idea um i think it definitely boils boils down to how you interpret it yeah. um and you can definitely get some ideas from it like so i have a few songs that I've, i'm in a band called broom riders and like we have some songs that like i've actually like they've come to me like through a dream i had and i woke up and just quickly wrote it down mm -hmm. or recorded yeah. it you know yeah you're not the only one i've heard of other people come into certain revelations in the dream state yeah oh there's yeah there's gotta be something to it there's uh yeah. like there's uh i remember i was listening to i think it was joe rogan actually he said that uh you know, ideas have to be like, they're almost like their own thing. And they use us as a, uh, like a, a tool to just get out. Like we're just the arbiter of ideas. We're just the way that these ideas that you could look at as almost like a being express themselves is through us. And if you, if you look at it, like it could be through dreams or it could be through some kind of um, chemical, you know, induction, but like there's, I mean, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Like, there's just ideas come from the other side, whatever you want to call it. And they have to do it in certain ways to, where our brain, um, when our perception is altered. Yeah, there's a book called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. Um, and I don't know if that's where Rogan got it from. Um, or maybe she got it from Rogan. I don't know. What's her name? Uh, Ford is the last name, I believe. Betty Ford, I think. Uh, but she mentions that as well, that ideas are like entities. And so if you have an idea and somebody else executes that idea, you can't be mad that they did it because that entity came to you. You didn't do anything with it and said, all right, fuck this and went to somebody else and they did something with it. Mm, that's interesting. You know? Yeah. I don't know how much I believe that, but you know. Mm. but there's been times i've had ideas and then somebody executes it i'm like damn i had that idea oh yeah that happens to me i think that happens to a lot of people <laughs> uh, you know and especially now because of the internet you can yeah. now see that other people also have your idea like you know 30 years ago 40 years ago 50 years ago if you had an idea and i had an idea and it was the same idea we were probably never going to meet each other yeah and we would go the rest of our lives thinking, oh, I have this very original idea that no one else has ever thought of. But mm -hmm. now, again, you know, you could see it everywhere that other people have similar ideas. Yeah. Please send me, please, little girl. <laughs> and I think it just comes down to tapping in to that same energy or that same vibration that we were talking about before. And it, it can choose to communicate with you, and you but you can choose... Yeah, I mean, it, it, it may communicate with you, but you can choose to listen to it or not, or how you want to, what you want to do with that kind of energy. Of course. I believe that, man. There's, to a certain extent, I do believe that. Sure. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, I, I mean, I think we covered a lot in this thing. Your cat seems kind of hungry. So if you want to wrap this thing up, <laughs> sure, sorry about is there anything that. you want to get off your chest before we wrap this thing up? Uh, I hope everyone is safe out there, um, and I cannot wait for the world to reopen and we can all get together again. Like I, I miss all you humans so much. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. I don't know when that's gonna be, but yeah, hopefully that that will be a good day. The day of opening, it'll be like, all right, everything's good, guys. We're good to go. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, I'm just like I'm dying to play a show. 
I'm dying to go to a, like, I just want to go to a dive bar and see some like gutter punk band play <laughs> and just drink fucking well whiskey and shitty beer, like, yeah. and stink of cigarettes or like, just, oh, I just want to go to a fucking show. Like, so bad. Yeah, just, yeah, the good old days, man. Make some, make some bad memories or good yeah, memories, exactly. depending on how you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you. The day will come. We just got to, you know, stay healthy, keep your head down and, just uh we're gonna be okay you know we'll, we'll be okay, okay. totally <laughs> all right thank you tom tom Hatsis, is that how you say your name i, didn't, I don't think i yeah. even said your last name this whole time oh it's all right oh can i can i do one plug though plug anything you want man so uh my partner eden and i run a psychedelics harm reduction uh an education group called sanctum psychedelia we are in the process of building the largest digital library of psychedelic literature um, on, if you go to sanctum.org, that's P-S-A-N-C-T-U-M.org, uh, you can see the beginnings of it. There's some articles up already, but it's, it's everything from, you know, the first, uh, you know, uh, American encounters with peyote in the late 1800s to CIA mind control tests. I have actually one of them is right here this is one that i recently added this is a cia document uh about uh using psychedelics for mind control uh this is here like mk ultra yeah exactly mk ultra um i've got a bunch of mk ultra documents uh this is called the therapeutic gazette this is from 1896 and there's like two different uh, write-ups of peyote use in it by Westerners. It's some of the first, you know, literature on peyote use that we have. Um, and uh, so many other things. I mean, the, the collection is, it's like a huge stack of papers uh, oh. and some rare books as well, um, uh, like conference notes and things like that, or uh, conference minutes, I should say. It would be a more accurate way of putting it. That's um, cool, man. From the first psychedelic conferences ever. Like, I what have that. Here. What's that? When was that? In 1951 was the first, when was the first round table? It was 51, 52, somewhere around the early 1950s. I, I apologize. I don't remember the, the exact year. That's cool. Um, but it was, or maybe, I think it was 54. When did, when did Sanderson come in? I think it's 54. It's okay. Early 50s. We'll just say early 50s. Uh, early to mid 50s was the first. But anyway, so they, they started having these conferences and, you know, they were transcribed and I have the transcripts of them. So that's awesome, man. I'll definitely uh, head over there actually too. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. Um, yeah. Again, Sanctum with a P. Awesome, man. Well, and, uh, I appreciate okay. you coming on. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Gary. Thank you. Fun. Yeah, yeah, psychedelic historian on YouTube, and that's the name of your website, right? Yeah, um, psychedelic historian is the website as well, and uh, that's where people could check out like and buy books I've written and read articles I've written. Um, there's a bunch of free articles up there, um, and uh, yeah, we have uh, Sanctum Psychedelia has a Patreon as well, uh, just Sanctum Psychedelia on Patreon. Um, uh, also has a YouTube page. But again, not enough uh, subscribers yet. So if you just go and uh, type in Sanctum Psychedelia in YouTube, we have we threw a conference last year and we have all these videos from the conference and more to come. Cool. I'll link everything. Cool. Please do. Cool, man. All right. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again. I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, yeah, if you ever want to come back on and go into the depths of the, the, of the human mind, let me know. Absolutely, man. Anytime. I'm, I always love talking about this stuff. So whenever you want, just let me know. Cool. Cool. All right. Tom Hatzis, Psychedelic Historian, signing up. Peace, all. Thanks.